course, my lady, I was addressing the court on the issue of key findings of fact, and I had taken the court to the judge's findings as to the reason why the ship was unable to complete her voyage. Um, the next key finding of fact comes from paragraph A12, so appendix 12, at page 90 of the judgment, or paragraph 8 of the judgment itself, and that is that the only viable port of refuge was Willems Harbour. So there was no choice about where the vessel was going to go. And in order to secure permission to proceed through the English Channel, my clients incurred significant costs and expenses by way of liabilities to various government bodies. And this is the heading um, that Malone and calls the cost of proceeding to Willems Harbour. The overwhelming majority of these costs and expenses uh, the judge held at A14, which is at page 90 uh, of the judgment were payments under the International Convention on Civil Liability for Bunker Oil Pollution Damage, 2001. And that is a convention that permits states uh, to charge owners in the respect of uh, preventative and precautionary measures taken in relation to the threat of bunker pollution. Sorry, can you give us the cross-reference in the judgment? A14. Thank you. Core Bundle, tab 5, page 90. Um, uh, and that is the convention that permits government bodies to <coughs> charge owners in respect of precautionary and preventative measures taking in, in response to the threat of pollution damage. So these sums, uh, we, we say, were essentially paid because of the risk that bunkers would escape from the damaged vessel. Uh, uh, and consistently with um, owners' intention to repair the vessel, we had invited tenders from repair yards even before the vessel arrived at Willemshaven and were consulting with Germanisha Lloyd about the stability conditions that would allow the vessel to proceed to the repair yard. That's paragraph 25, subparagraph 4 at page 50 uh, of the core bundle. Um, pausing there, my learned friend made yesterday a point about whether, if one were looking at the intention of the owners, one would look at their subjective or their objective intention and problems that might ensue if one were looking at a subjective intention. Uh, we would, to a large extent, agree. I don't submit that either this court or the judge should have taken into account the subjective intention of my clients. But it was their objective intention, or their intention objectively assessed by looking at the evidence that matters. And as I say, one of the pieces of evidence the judge took into account was that consistently with our intention to repair, we had invited tenders even before the vessel got to the port of refuge. Um, next, um, uh, uh, I'm now at paragraph 25, <coughs> little 10, on page 51. After the vessel arrived at Willemshaven, all discussions with the German authorities, the authorities responsible for supervising the discharge of the vessel, were predicated on the assumption that the vessel was going to be repaired. So when we were negotiating waste disposal and such like, all of those discussions were predicated on the assumption that the vessel was going to be repaired. Uh, but because the vo vessel could not complete her voyage, owners, that's my clients, arranged to discharge cargo at Willemshaven. That's paragraph 11 of the judgment at page 44 of Core Bundle Tab 5. And this was a result of the voyage having been abandoned. I stress the voyage having been abandoned there. Of course, <coughs> the vessel has not been. And that's paragraph 25, little 6 at page 51. As part of that process, uh, the salvageable cargo had to be decontaminated, and the unsalvageable cargo, the unclaimed cargo, had to be destroyed. That's paragraph 11 at page 44. And discharge of sound and damaged containers that needed to be removed before the ship could be repaired began on the 28th of September. And that's um, A20, so Appendix 20, page 91, the first um, sentence. Uh, 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 and if you have page 91 um, open, A22 is the, the next important point. Uh, the owners, so my clients, incurred significant costs at Willemshaven, all of which had to be incurred 
in order ultimately to repair the ship. So if one creates an umbrella heading neutrally called costs at Willemshaven, rather than costs of discharge, as my learned friend says, or costs of removal, as he would like uh, the court to conclude, if one neutrally says costs at Willemshaven, they all had to be incurred ultimately to repair the ship. Uh, and in that respect, one of the headings in the annex that I took my lords to yesterday, my lady, was costs in Germany. So that, that was how these costs were broadly described uh, by us when making our claim. And it's most of those costs, the costs we describe as costs in Germany, that ended up under um, my learned friend's client's heading of costs of discharging, cleaning, storing, transshipping, and releasing the cargo. Uh, and it's that narrative description that is agreed, not that that has any significance we submit in terms of categorization for limitation purposes. <coughs> That's just a factual description of what those costs um, relate to. Um, back to um, A20, if I can, on page 91. During the discharge process, the condition of the ship was being repeatedly assessed by Germanisha Lloyd by reference to her ability to undertake a voyage to the repair yard. So the sound uh, uh, and damaged cargo was coming off. The waste and the water was going to stay behind. But there was an ongoing process of assessing whether the vessel would be stable enough to undertake a voyage to the repair yard, uh, 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 and therefore what other uh, ballast might need to be put on board, counterweights put on board, and how the, the stability of the vessel could be um, optimized for the voyage to a repair yard. And throughout um, the stay, I'm now I'm afraid flipping back to page 50 of the bundle at paragraph 25.6, throughout the vessel's stay at Willems Harbour, the question of what might or might not be discharged there in terms of waste and water was being driven by what needed to be done in order to put the ship into a fit state to go to the repair yard. <coughs> so considerations as to how much water, if any, to take off, how much waste, if any, to take off, uh, and such like, were all being driven uh, by the question of what state the vessel needed to be in in order to go to the repair yard. And um, uh, A27, at page uh, 93, during negotiations with possible repair facilities, uh, my client's manager was actively considering the possibility of undertaking the voyage to the repair yard with the remaining waste and at least some of the firefighting water still on board. So it was an actively considered possibility that all the waste and the firefighting water, or at least some of it, would still be on board when the vessel got to the repair yard and would be removed by the repair company. And specifically, uh, I'm now back to paragraph 25X, followed by 2510. Specifically, our negotiations uh, with the yard that was awarded the contract were all on the basis that the yard would remove the waste. And as the court is aware, in, in the end, the yard removed some of the waste, but not all of it. Where the plan, while the vessel was at Willemshaven, was that the waste would be removed at the repair yard, i.e., we say, as part of the repair process. Um, Paragraph 16 of the judgment, page 45, after discharge of the cargo was complete, about 30,000 tonnes of firefighting water remained on board. That firefighting water had to be removed before repairs could be commenced. And that, we would hope, is a statement of the obvious, but the judge made a finding to that effect. Sorry, paragraph again? Um, the, the, I had previously referred to 16 at Thank page you. 45, my lady. And I'm now looking at A23 at page 92. So A23. Um, was that the water had to be removed uh, before repairs could be commenced. Um, paragraph 16 at page 45. The water was contaminated with dangerous and toxic residues of the cargo and of the fire itself, so not just cargo residues. And my clients were therefore obliged to ensure that it was disposed of lawfully. But there was no suggestion, uh, and this is now paragraph 25, little 16 on page 52, no suggestion that my clients were obliged to discharge the water at Willemshaven or to discharge it anywhere in particular. The only compulsion on them was to ensure that it was disposed of lawfully once it was discharged. So that's the water. 
the waste, there was about 30,500 metric tonnes of waste on board. Uh, that's paragraph 20 at C, tab 5, page 45. And paragraph 22, all of that waste contained or was contaminated with dangerous and toxic residues of the cargo and of the fire. Um, and we were therefore obliged <coughs> to ensure that that was disposed of lawfully um, as well. Um, the attitude, and now paragraph 2510, the attitude of the German authorities meant that it was likely that the waste would have to be disposed of, that, that process would have to be completed in an EU country, and that is because of the EU regulations on exporting waste outside the community. But, um, and that's paragraph 25, little 15 now on page 52, there was no suggestion that we were obliged to discharge the waste at Willemshaven or anywhere else in particular. But as with the water, the only compulsion was on how it was to be disposed of after discharge. A and against that background, in the end, the firefighting water was discharged while the vessel was still at Willemshaven, but not until February 2013. Uh, that date appears from paragraph 18 of the judgment page 45, and so well after completion of the discharge of the sound and damaged cargo, which uh, occurred on the 18th of December, that's paragraph 13 at, at page 44. So the discharging operation is completed on the 18th of December, and there's then a delay before um, the vessel sails during which the water is, is eventually discharged. We don't need to go into why it was because the company originally contracted for it, it turned out to be not capable of doing the job. <coughs> um, some waste was removed um, after the vessel arrived at the repair yard in Romania. Um, the narrative for this is paragraphs 24 to 27 of the judgment, at page 46. Uh, the vessel then sailed to Denmark, where the job could be done, it had transpired more efficiently. Um, and and the waste, uh, remaining waste was removed in Denmark and the vessel returned to Romania for repairs, paragraph 29. Uh, and that is, um, we suggest, um, the relevant factual background to the characterisation process that, that you have to undertake. Uh, and I've obviously flagged the key points as to what owners were doing, why they were doing it, and the extent, if any, to which there were other factors at play, such as waste disposal regulations. I'm going to turn uh, now, I I if I may, uh, as I said in my route map, to the insider-outsider point. But, but before doing so, just one small point um, le left over from yesterday, um, which I did deal with yesterday but missed one point out. Um, you'll recall that my learned friend submitted that one of the purposes of limitation, when one's looking at the purpose of limitation, was to ensure an orderly distribution of the fund. Uh, and I submitted to, to the court yesterday that that was correct once you'd established a fund and who was obliged to, to limit their claims, whose claims were limitable, but was not a relevant factor to the question the court is concerned with, which is what claims are, are limitable? Are my clients obliged to prove against the fund? Uh, and I, I'm reminded um, overnight by my learned junior uh, that that was a point that my learned friend made on a previous occasion in front of the judge um, I, I can hand out the, the judgment if necessary, but I, I hope it isn't for these purposes. Um, on a previous occasion, we were threatening to enforce our claims <coughs> in a jurisdiction that did not um, give effect to the 1976 Convention. I, indeed, we're doing so, or seeking to do so. And my learned friend sought an anti-suit injunction from the court, saying it's not permitted for you, where we've established a limitation fund, to go off and enforce elsewhere so as to, to avoid the limitation fund. Um, one of the points he made in support of that application was that limitation is uh, akin to an insolvency and that therefore we should be obliged to, to bring our claims as part of the insolvency process. Uh, and that was um, a, a, a position that the, the judge rejected on three grounds, um, two of which are relevant. One is that the amended convention provides for an orderly means of pari passu distribution of a particular fund between claimants who opt to claim against that fund. Um, it, the pari passu consideration is, is, is therefore irrelevant uh, unless and until someone opts to claim against the fund. And the second <coughs> is that a limitation action involves neither all of the limiting parties' assets 
ignore all of its credits, creditors. Uh, and, and that's um, paragraph 95 of the, the judgment, so I can hand it up if necessary, but I hope it's not contentious with my learned friend at this stage. And he has provided overnight uh, a further authority on, on this point, a, a decision in a case called the Liverpool, which he'll no doubt take the court to in his reply. But since I don't have a, a right of response to his reply, I'll just deal with the Liverpool briefly, if I may now. Um, that is a case in which the Court of Appeal had to consider the distribution of the fund as between those who were claiming on the fund. Uh, and it was a case where a harbour authority had made a claim in respect of wreck removal costs against the owner of the vessel. Um, and the owner of the vessel had paid, but only a, a limited amount because they had a limit of liability against the harbour authority. And in the collision claim between the two ships that had collided and caused the incident, the owners of the innocent vessel claimed uh, essentially a recourse action in respect of what they had paid the harbour authority. But the harbour authority also claimed the limitation fund for the full amount of their loss. And the point was taken, well, you can't bring the same claim against the limitation fund twice under two different guises. <coughs> and that was the respect in which the Court of Appeal said, well, it's analogous to a, to a bankruptcy situation. You can't have the same claim being advanced twice uh, I I against the bankrupt's assets. <coughs> Likewise, you can't have the same claim being advanced twice against the limitation fund. But that doesn't assist the Court in our respectful submission. We would not disagree with the suggestion that limitation is analogous to a bankruptcy or insolvency in that limited respect. And that doesn't go to the question um, of, of uh, which claims are or are not limitable under the Convention. Mr Smith, I can see why you might want to get your retaliation in first, but in fact you would have a right of reply in relation to any new case which is raised for the first time in a reply. S it, at least I think since, would. <laughs> since my learned friend has been kind enough to provide it overnight, I yes. thought I'd deal with it all at the one time. Yeah. So, my, my lords, with that introduction, my, and my lady, uh, on to the insider-outsider point. A and um, the, the starting point in, in defining that issue is the respondent's notice, if I can ask um, the court to take that up at C, tab 15, page 148. And, and the point we make in the main paragraph on page 148 is that on a proper construction of the 1976 Convention against the backdrop of the reason why charters were first afforded the right to limit and, um, and all the persons of the Convention, provisions of the Convention, a charter can limit its liability in respect of, and only in respect of, liabilities that originate outside the group of entities that are defined as owners for the purposes of limitation. Um, as identified in Article 1, 2. And on the facts of that case, that would, of our case, that would mean that charterers could limit in respect of the claims of the London cargo claimants, a any recourse claim by my clients in respect of the London cargo claimants, if, if my clients were held liable to them, the claims of the dependents of the deceased crew and my client's recourse claim in respect of the sums we have paid to the um, <coughs> dependents of the deceased crew. Um, and um, in that respect, uh, our submission is that the right to limit um, is provided to all of those within, uh, as I called it in front of the judge, the genus, the group defined as owners um, uh, under the convention, where they have a common potential exposure to the relevant claim. And that's a phrase that uh, Mr Justice David Steele used at paragraph 45 uh, uh, of the Jakarta decision at first instance. Uh, and, and the reason for that is to avoid the claimant picking and choosing which defendant to bring a claim against in order to defeat the right to limit. Uh, and we submit that the position is neatly and correctly summarised in Griggs on limitation of liability for maritime claims that you have at tab 21 of the authorities bundle, there's a table at page 389 that lists those entitled to the limit. Um, 
29, summary, the persons entitled to limit their liability are, one, ship owners, two, charterers, brackets, but not against ship owners. And that essentially encapsulates our position. Uh, and we'll come back to a, another passage in, in, in Mr. Briggs' book um, later. Is, is your position then, looking at this table, that um, the insider outside of point only operates one way, so that charterers can't limit against ship owners, but ship owners can limit against charterers? Um, my Lord, um, yes, um, uh, for today's purposes. Uh, before the judge, I put the matter somewhat higher and said that the argument, the insider outsider argument, cut both ways. And, and I'll come back to deal with this because that's one of the points in the judge's reasoning against me that it, it would produce strange results if it cut both ways. Yes. But consciously, in the respondent's name, <coughs> we have framed it in a way that does not cut both ways. And I'll deal with that as I go along I I in our submission. So that's why I took, took the court straight away to the respondent's notice to set out the point we actually take. And I'm about to take the court to the 1927 convention, and we'll see where that distinction um, originates. Um, yeah. So, uh, so what, I mean, what you're about to develop is really a new argument, not one that was put in this form to the judge. A, 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 a variation of the argument w w was put to the judge, yes. I mean, in, in front of the judge. What mattered in front of the judge was whether charters could limit in respect to the ship owner's claim, because that was the point that the judge was dealing with. But I accepted in my submission that the insider-outsider point, um, I think it arose during the course of discussion with the judge, um, if pushed, would include everybody within the judge. But our primary submission for today's <coughs> purposes is that it, it only cuts one way. Um, so. Um, we submit and, and well, no doubt you'll get there, but that's that's how you answer the point that, for example, that would include uh, the wider submission would prevent the owners from limiting in respect of a cargo claim if the charterers own the cargo. Precisely. Yes. Um, so, um, in the light of the provisions of the Vienna Convention that I took the court to yesterday, uh, we submit that it is appropriate um, for this court to look at the background and context of the 1976 Convention. Uh, and, and that involves starting with the Convention that first gave charterers the right to limit, uh, which is the 1924 um, Convention. Yeah, just before we go to that, is, does, um, does the, I mean the, um, the way you're now putting it appears quite clearly from the summary on page 389 of um, the Griggs book, uh, which is where the penny dropped with me, I must say. Um, does, the, does the text discuss the point? Um, the, the text, uh, it, it, it deals with it very briefly, and that's the passage, um, well I'll take my laws to it now, my lady, at um, tab 21, page 381. But I, I was going to take this quote in its chronological order. But well, well take, it, take, take it later, that's fine. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take it later if I may, because it does fit into the chronology of the convention. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so um, the, the 1924 convention, um, the court has in the authorities bundle at divider 3, and if I can ask the court to look at page 11, this convention was signed by the United Kingdom but never enacted. For present purposes, that, that doesn't in our submission matter, because if we're construing the conventions and we're looking at the convention as part of the history of the 76 convention, whether or not it, it became part of the law <coughs> of the United Kingdom is, is neither here nor there. Um, and, and Article 1 provides that um, the liability of the owner um, it is limited in respect of, one, compensation due to third parties. So it, it's looking at third parties outside of, of the maritime adventure. 
Two, compensation due by reason of damage caused either to the cargo delivered to the master to be transported or any goods and property on board. Uh, and then I think the other provisions are, are not particularly relevant. Um, apart from five, uh, which is relevant in the context of Article uh, 2 on F when we get to it, any <coughs> obligation to remove the wreck of a sunken vessel and any um, obligations connected therewith. And the right to limit in Article 1, which is given to owners, is extended by Article 10 on page 14, which provides that where the person who operates the vessel without owning it, or the principal charterer, is liable under one of the heads enumerated in Article 1, the provisions of this convention are applicable to him. So the structure of this convention is to give owner the right to limit and say that if principal charterer or operator is liable for one of the same claims, then principal charterer or operator shall likewise have the right to limit. What's the principal charterer? Is that the head charter? charterer? Um, not clear, my lord, and we'll see when we come to look at the 57 convention. That is one of the reasons why um, you get a, reference, a wider reference to charterers. But under English law at this time, a demise charterer had the benefit of the English statute, but nobody else. Yes. So there's, there's no assistance that I'm aware of on the meaning of principal charter. It might mean a bare boat charter, it might mean a head time charter. It probably means something other than a voyage charterer or sub voyage charterer or slot charterer. There probably wasn't such a thing as a slot charterer in 1957. Um, and we say that that approach to limitation is confirmed by the wording of Articles 1 1 and 1 4, which all require some degree of fault on the part of someone in the service of the vessel. <coughs> someone is looking at the vessel and fault on the part of the vessel, um, or Article 1-2 that requires damage to something that's on board the vessel, cargo or something. So uh, uh, our submission would be that if one were looking at the 1924 <coughs> Convention, and I'll come back to develop this this afternoon when I look at the individual heads of the claim, none of the claims that we are concerned with would have been limitable under the 1924 Convention. Sorry, 1924. The next international convention is the 1957 convention, which the court has at tab four. Uh, and there is a slightly different wording of the claims that are limitable. And that appears at the top of page 22. Loss of life or personal injury to any person on board being carried on the ship, and loss of life and loss of or damage to any property on board the ship. So, a narrow definition at A relating to persons or property on board the ship. And then a slightly wider definition at B loss of life or personal injury to any other person um, and property not on board the ship, caused by the act, neglect, or default of any person on board the ship. So if, if something happens on board the ship, that's within the limitation <coughs> regime. If something happens <coughs> extraneous to the ship uh, due to the fault of those on board, the classic case being a, a collision action where the cargo on board the other vessel is damaged, then there's a right of limit. Um, C, at page 23, relevantly for the court's consideration, any obligation or liability imposed by any law relating to the removal of wreck and arising from or in connection with the raising, removal, or destruction of any ship which is sunk, stranded, or abandoned, including anything which may be on board such ship, and any obligation or liability arising out of damage caused to harbour works. Uh, and that's what becomes uh, subparagraphs D and E in the 1976 Convention. But it's, it's necessary I show my lords and my lady what the 1927 Convention says, the 1957 Convention says because the Travo make it clear that D and E combined are supposed to reflect what's in C, but with some clarification 
and that will be relevant when we come on to look at the travo in relation to B and E of the symbol of this commit. And the right to limit under the 57 Convention is afforded to a slightly wider category of persons by Article 6.2 at page 25. Subject to paragraph 3 of this article, uh, which isn't relevant for the present purposes, that's to do with when the master is personally at fault. The provisions of this convention shall apply to the charterer, manager, and operator of the ship, and to the masters and members of the crew and other servants of the owner, charter, manager, or operator, acting in the course of their employment, and these words are words we stress in the same way as they apply to an owner himself. So again, what is envisaged is a group of claims for which the owner might be liable and a limitation right that is then granted to the charterers and others in the same way as to the owner, which we say strongly suggests that that right is only given to the charterers in respect of um, claims where they would be liable as well as the owner. So we've lost the reference to third parties, but you say it's... Still implicitly there. It's still implicitly there, uh, and we say by definition that, that that right to limit can't apply to claims by the owner against the charterer, because th that would not be limiting in the same way as they apply to the owner himself. And, and that's where I was going to come back, um, my lord, to the other passage in Griggs, um, because this convention uh, was uh, signed by the United Kingdom, enacted into United Kingdom law by the then technique that parliamentary draftsmen used of amending the Merchant Shipping Act rather than making it a schedule for the Merchant Shipping Act. So that was the first time that charterer rather than demise charterer was entitled to limit under English law. And, and what the authors of Greeks say about that um, supports what we say is the proper construction of the 57 Convention. That's at page 381. where um, they say as follows, the primary reason <coughs> for extending the class of persons entitled to limit was to overcome the problem first encountered in the case of the Himalaya, namely attempts by a claimant in order to circumvent the effects of limitation of liability to bring a claim against some person other than the owner, for example, the master of the vessel. And we've got the Himalaya in, in the bundle. I hope it's not necessary to go to it because I hope it's not contentious that what happened in that case was that the claimant sued officers of the ship who did not have the benefit of liability <coughs> to avoid the fact that her claim for personal injuries would be substantially limited. So she'd make a very low recovery against the owners. So she sued the master and the officers who were not entitled to, to limit um, in order to avoid the limitation provision <coughs> uh, in circumstances where um, the owners were obliged under the crew's contracts of employment to indemnify them so the owners would end up paying more than the limit through the back door. Um, that was a result that highly commended itself to Lord Denning in the Court of Appeal because he thought the owners shouldn't be entitled to limit in respect to these kind of claims in any event. Uh, but, but nonetheless, in a more commercial context than a personal injury claim, the problem was that a charterer, for example, if they could, um, it, 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 sorry, a claimant, cargo claimant, for example, if they could sue both the charterer and the owner, could avoid the effect of limitation by suing the charterer. Um, the owner might then face a claim from the charterer um, and end up paying the full amount, even though, as against the cargo claimant, they would have been entitled <coughs> to limit. So Griggs is certainly the view that that's why charterers were being given the right to limit. Chronologically, it's not quite right to say that was the first time charterers had the right to limit, because as we've seen, the 1924 convention Gave, gave that right to limit to the principal charter. But as an English law analysis, it was the first time. And we do um, respectfully agree that the reasoning behind um, renewing the charter's right to limit in the 57 Convention is principally to avoid the Himalaya type problem. So it looks to me as if Griggs goes on to say, well, the right of a char charter to limit in respect of third party claims is clearly appropriate, but um, it's rather tentative about claims by the owners for damage suffered by the owner. And in fact, the reason why they think that 
that may not arise is not because of your insider-outsider point, but because it's damage to the ship is not damage to property occurring on board or in duck, so it's really the CR Major Carter point. Mm my lord in in one sense yes i take the point w one step further but when we go to look at the cm major carter in the gnc particular first instance <coughs> uh, particularly the judgment of mr justice thomas he doesn't quite put it the way i put it but it, it's very close to the way we put it uh, and i'll come on to take, take the court if i may in a moment to passages in that um, can i just while we're on the 57 convention um, make one further point which is by reference to the travo for the 57 convention which the court have in the authorities bundle tab 22, that's the second file in the authority of Iran, at page 711. This is a debate going on about the wording of Article 6.2. We see that from page 601. Sorry, 701. Um, so we, we see Article 6 set out at 700 and, and 701. Uh, and, it, and it's in French. But the, the version under debate would have given the right to limit to anybody liable in respect of the claims set out in Article 1. So without identifying charters or others, it would have just said anybody liable for the claims set out in <coughs> Article 1 um, can limit. Uh, and um, the English delegate m made the quite sensible point at page 703 that, that, that that would be a nonsense because, and the example he gave is, if I'm flying my aeroplane and I crash onto the ship and i um, on the deck and kill a large number of passengers, I'm liable for one of the claims in Article 1 but as the pilot of my aeroplane, clearly it was never intended that I should have the benefit of limitation. And so, so we need to review uh, the wording in, in Article 6 to have a better definition. And there was then a debate between an American amendment uh, and an English amendment uh, as to whether that would include the words time charterer as well as demise charterer. But the context I, I want to show uh, that the court is at page 711 where Mr. Rhine, the Norwegian delegate, gave um, the example that we're looking at. Uh, a, a mistake is made in the stowage of the ship. Um, that is to say where stowed, uh, they've stowed flammable and explosive material in a place where it should not have been stowed. Um, uh, um, you have a catastrophe that occurs and, and you need to ensure um, and I think the better reference is actually probably at, at page 709 and it's Mr. Ryan again any other person who happens to come in the same position as that of the ship owner to incur liability for claims of exactly this nature should have the same benefit as has the ship owner. So that's the red line in the second red line paragraph. No, I forget the call. Sorry, we don't have the red lines, yes. Um, there's a paragraph beginning, it is obvious. Yes. Um, and therefore, therefore, our basic view is that any other person who happens to come into the same position as that of the ship owner to incur liability for claim of exactly <laughs> this nature should have the same benefit. <coughs> so it, it's basically reversing to what we said was the proper construction of the 24 convention, which is that if you've got claims that can be made against the owner, but the claimant has the option of bringing them against somebody else as well, that other party should have the same rights to limit uh, as the owner. Well, what do you think the reference to the same position of that of the owner actually... Having the benefit of the same limitation fund, my lady and requiring the creditor to prove um, the claimant to, to prove against that. Sorry, no, it, I think it's the prior question. It's the nature of who should be able to limit. It's saying someone in the same position should have the same ability to limit. I'm querying what is being said as the same position. Do you mean standing in a similar position to the owner? doing something that an owner would do, or what? Um, no, I simply mean somebody liable on the same claim as the owner, so somebody who could face the same cargo claim. So if the claimant has the option of suing the owner, perhaps in bailment, if they are charterers' bills of ladings, or the charterer in contract, sued the charterer, 
the, the Norwegian position, reflecting the position of all the other delegates, um, were, was, well, they, they should have the same rights as limitation. Because otherwise, the claimant can circumvent owner's right to limit by suing the claimant. So you'll have to identify a claim that could be brought against the owner. Those are identified in Article uh, 1 of the Convention. Yes. So I if the it. Charter is liable in respect of one of the same claims enumerated in Article 1, then they should have the same right of limit in respect of those claims as the owner has. I mean, I'm a bit troubled by this because you're taking us to one speech in a debate mm -hmm. about a, what seems not to have been the final version of the text anyway. Um, and how how does that show the clear and unambiguous um, requirement is met uh, for the travaux to be helpful? Um, my lord, the reason I took my my lord um, originally to um, Article Six is, is it was originally being debated, uh, which referred to anybody liable for the same claims, and the English example of the Arab case. <coughs> to show that th there was a consensus and that the two amendments that were proposed was the, the United States one and the UK one. And the debate was simply between the slightly different wording of those two, but they both proceeded on the basis that, that appears from the, the, the Norwegian um, delegates' um, speech that I was just reading from. And the, the problem is, to, to prove a negative, I'd really have to read every single page of the travel. Yes. Um, but, but it is our submission that that what was said in those passages I, I've taken the court to reflects a consensus that, that finds itself in the final wording. Because in the final wording, the UK amendment, which instead of saying everybody liable in respect of those claims, listed the persons, charters, etc., that I took my lords to when, uh, and my lady to when I read the convention as enacted. Um, the debate was about how to get round the aeroplane landing on the deck point. There was no debate about the underlying point that everybody involved in the venture who might be liable on the same claim should have the same right to limit. Okay. And again, uh, we would um, suggest um, that. Um, under the 1957 convention, none of the claims that we are concerned with on this hearing would have been used on, and I'll come back to that when I address the claim. But Mr Justice Thomas, I said I was coming to... Uh, Mr Justice Thomas um, looked at the 1957 travel when uh, uh, reaching his decision. So if I could ask the court to have tab 13, page 229 of the authorities bundle. Did you say? Two nine. Two nine. Thank you. Um, and um, th this is um, left hand column, the, the penultimate paragraph. Mr. Justice Thomas says he's referred to the, the travaux preparatoire. He then uh, refers to the decision in Fothergill, which we don't need to look at. Uh, and then in the final paragraph at the foot of the left-hand column, going over the right-hand column, as to whether the papers showed a clear legislative intent, one clear legislative intent emerged. The view was clearly expressed that it was not justifiable to exclude charterers from the benefits enjoyed by demise charterers. The charterer was often the effective operator of the ship and should have the benefit of limitation person who fulfilled the role of the ship owner and therefore incurred the liabilities of the ship owner, uh, a ship owner would incur, should, it was thought, have the benefit of the same protection as the ship owner. Um, of the common uh, situations where a charter would incur liabilities for a ship owner, one of the common <coughs> situations was where the charter's bill of lading had been issued without a demise clause or identical carrier clause, or where claims were brought in jurisdictions where such clauses were not recognised. So those are the examples um, I, I gave the court a little while ago. Uh, and we 
suggest going back to Article 1 of the 1957 Convention. Um, back in Divider 5. Sorry, Divider 4. But I mean, your basic point is that a charter cannot be liable in the same way as a ship owner in respect of a claim which only a ship owner has. Indeed. My lord, yes. Yes, that's precisely the point. Um, and, and so, um, following on from that, if one looks at the categories of claim that are limitable under Article 1, um, limitation would not be available in respect of damage to the ship uh, because of the way um, the definitions are framed. And the 1957 Convention, unlike the 24 Convention, but like the 1976 Convention, provided for a, a single limitation fund and a single um, limit of liability. Um, and that is the point, uh, another point, that, that um, appeared to Mr Justice Thomas in the GMC to be important. Uh, and we can see that um, from uh, page 45 uh, at the left-hand column. Uh, which was uh, a little above where I was reading from earlier at page 229. Um, and there's a paragraph beginning, however, in the middle of the page. Uh, the second sentence begins, the total liability of the ship owners, charters and others was to be subject to one limit of liability determined by the tonnage of the ship. The terms of the 1957 Convention, and in particular the single limit of liability and the constitution of one, constitution of one fund, make it difficult to see how the provisions of that Convention were meant to provide to charterers or the others interested uh, listed in Article 6 a right to limit their liability in the event of claims by ship owners against them. So that, that was Mr Justice Thomas's conclusion about the 1957 Convention mm -hmm. and we say he's absolutely right on that. Difficult to see how the intention could have been that charterers or the others listed in Article 6 could limit against the ship owners. Uh, um, and my Lord, this is stage by stage dealing with the point my Lord put to me at the beginning <coughs> of my submissions about how we now frame to the insider outside context. So we say that prior to 1976, it is quite clear that charters um, are not entitled to limit their liability in response to a claim by the owner. And the 1976 convention was intended to update the 1957 convention and to make three very specific um, changes. An increase in the amount of the limitation fund a much restricted right to break limits and the extension of the right to limit to salvos not, by, not operating from the vessel. And that was in response to the House of Lords decision in the Tojo Maru, which again, the court has, but I don't think we need to go to, where it was held that a, a diver who was not operating from a vessel, um, the salvage company couldn't limit their liability. And it was widely perceived that that was not fair. Um, therefore, the salvos in that position were given the right to limit. Uh, and as Mr. Justice Thomas said at page 46 in the Indian <coughs> Sea, um, the left-hand column, the first full paragraph, I was also referred to the Travo for the 1976 Convention. There was nothing in the Travo that indicated one way or other whether there was to be any change in the position of charters. The Travo was silent on that issue. So no suggestion in the Travo that the position of charters or their right to limit is intended to be extended. Um, in fact, if, if I may just briefly look at the, the Travo on, on that point from 76 before going to the 1976 Convention. A, tab 23, that's file 3 of the authorities' bundle. <coughs> page 967. This is the first discussion, paragraph one, that became paragraph one. Uh, um, it's before we even get in uh, to, to the, sorry, article two, article two, paragraph one of article two. Uh, and it's before we get into the nitty gritty of 21A, 21B, 21C. But it, it, it's the introductory paragraph subject to articles three and four, the following claims 
whatever the basis of liability may be shall be subject to limitation of liability. Um, and then it, it was explained that paragraph 1A of this draft deals with physical damage um, and personal liability. Paragraph 1B deals with exceptional mandatory liability for delay under a bill of lading. 1C deals with non-contractual damages. And we'll come on to look at those paragraphs in a moment. But then paragraph 23, the question was raised whether the provision was intended to have the same scope as the 1957 provision. And it explained that the CMI intended no change. So certainly in the scope of the claims that would be limited, no change intended. And the tool or drafting technique by which charterers were given the right to limit uh, uh, under the 1976 convention is slightly different again to the previous two conventions. And we, we see that, as the court is aware, but it's, it's helpful to have another look at it in tab 7, the authorities bundle, page 1, sorry, page 99. Ship owners and sound walls, as hereafter defined, may limit their liability in accordance with the rules of this convention. And ship owner, the term ship owner, Article 1, Paragraph 2, shall mean the owner, charter, or manager, or operator of the seagoing ship. So that creates what I previously referred to as the genus, the group of parties entitled <coughs> to limit, or as the judge put it, the inside. Uh, and it's significant, we submit, particularly given the background of the two previous conventions. The group of those entitled to limit as ship owners is defined on the one hand, and they are given one right to limit. Salvors are treated separately. So where the right to limit is extended to salvors, they're not lumped within the definition of ship owners. They're given a separate right to limit. Uh, uh, and we see later on in the convention that salvors have a separate limitation fund. Whereas the whole group of ship owners um, have a single limitation fund that's deemed to be constituted on, on behalf of all of them. Do you place any reliance on the principle which is sometimes deployed in domestic law of when you're having to construe a, a definition which extends the meaning of a term, that you, it's important to have regard to the term being defined as well as to the way in which the definition is extended? I mean, put it another way, does it, would you say it helps your case that charterers are being treated as, so to speak, deemed ship owners for this purpose? Um, the, the answer to my Lord's first point is, is no, because I'm constrained by the principles of the Vienna Convention yep. not to rely on domestic what I thought, yes. <laughs> The answer to my Lord's second point is, is yes, that is precisely our point. The fact that charterers are deemed to be ship owners um, is not suggestive, and it's very lowest, it's not suggestive that they can limit in respect of claims against other members of that group, uh, particularly read against the context of the previous convention, where they were given the right as in the same way as the owner would have. Uh, uh, and as I said, the, it's important then to note the provisions of Article 9.1a and 9.2, uh, which are at page 103 and 104. The limits of liability determined in accordance with Article 6. Article 6 sets out the formula for calculating the limit shall apply to the aggregate of all claims which arise on any distinct occasion. And then um, A, um, against the personal persons mentioned in paragraph 2 of Article 1, and any person for whose act, neglect, or default they're responsible. So you've got one single limit for everybody within the definition of ship owner. Separately from salvage, because they're not listed in Article um, 1. Paragraph 2. So, so that's my Lord's point in one sense, that because they're all within the group, they're defined as such, they're <coughs> perfect, there's only one fund. Yes, and in a way, it's a principle of common sense rather than one of domestic law as such. At least, well, maybe that's a, <laughs> well, my, a, a question, question being way of putting it. Uh, my Lord, it, it is tempting as an advocate to say it's a matter of common sense, but not everybody has the same view as to what is well, or is a matter of common sense. Uh, but but um, exactly. certainly, and I'll come on to submit. Uh, Mr. Justice Thomas was of, of this view. And then if we look at Article 9.2, the limits of liability um, 
determined in accordance with Article 7. So um, Article 7 is the passenger claim limit, and Article 6 is, is the other claim limit, shall apply to the aggregate of all claims. So this is the same provision, whether you're looking at the limit for cargo claims or the limit for personal injury claims, or passenger claims, rather. The claims are aggregated together by reference to the genus, the group of insiders. And then Article 11, um, 1, provides that any of the person, any person alleged to be liable, then that's liable for one of the claims enumerated, may constitute a fund of the court or other competent authority in any state party. And then Article 11, 3, a fund constituted by one of the persons mentioned in Article 1A, 1B, or C of Paragraph 2 of Article 9, or his insurer, should be deemed constituted by all of the persons. So, so the rule is that whether one is looking at the owner group, the salvo group, or the separate limitation fund for passengers. In e each occasion, if one of the persons liable creates a fund, constitutes a fund, then it's constituted on behalf of everybody. Um, and we submit that in, in this context, the obvious intention is that all of those parties within the definition of ship owner should have the benefit of a single fund in respect of claims <coughs> made by outsiders. And the object and purpose of giving the charterers the right to limit is to prevent outsiders bringing a claim, i.e. a claim, one for which the owner could have limited against the charter instead. The effect of these position, provisions is to put the claimant, <coughs> the outsider, in the same position they would be, whichever of the insiders they choose uh, to bring their claim against. Can I just understand, your, the, going to earlier versions of the Convention. When you when you look at the Vienna Convention, you have recourse to supplementary means of inter interpretation, where either to confirm or where there's ambiguity or obscurity. What do you say is um, the elements of the uh, 1976 Convention that introduces? That ambiguity. Um, my lady, um, two, two things in, in, in answer to that question. Um, the first is that even without am ambiguity, under Article Thirty One it's permissible to look at um, the terms of the treaty in their context and in yes. the light of their object and purpose. Yes, and do you include, for example, your points about Articles 9 and 11 in that? It, I include my points about Articles 9 and 11 of the 1976 Convention within that, but also in terms of discerning the object and purpose. Well, Article 31 purposes. It's legitimate in our submission to look at the previous convention, where th there is no apparent legislative intention to, to change them in, in 76. But to meet more directly my lady's point about going into Article 32, which is what expressly permits reference to the travel, um, we submit um, that, that, that actually the meaning of the 76 convention and the way it's structured by the drafting technique that I referred to of defining all those within the category of ship owners as a single category indicates the intention that those charters should be placed into that category should not have the right to limit against the ship owner. But in order to confirm that meaning, Article 32 permits you to look at the traveller. And insofar as there is any uncertainty about that meaning, Article 32 permits you to look at the Travo and indeed at the previous conventions and by definition the, the Travo for those conventions to determine the overall legislative intent of the conventions and the progression from 24 to 57 to 76, uh, which all in our submission have a common theme which is that charters have the right to limit when a claim comes from outside the group, 
but there's no intention in expanding the definition of ship owner to give those who are only ship owners because they're defined as such a right to limit against the ship owner himself. Thank you. I think the Supreme Court has quite recently given a judgment about um, the Vienna Convention and how you look at it in the... Um, oh, you're about to hand it up, are you? Um, I, I, w I was going to take my let's, lords to let's, it. Um, let's see if it's the same case. <laughs> uh, uh, I was going to take my lords to it later, and my lady, but can we... Can I hand it up now? I was going to deal with this at the end of my um, submissions, because Thank you. It, it doesn't make, uh, we would suggest, a any material difference, but I'll, I'll take it now. Um, Thank you. Judgment given on, on the 14th of June. I, I envisage this is the case. But yes, it is. This was a case dealing with the, the CMR convention that considered when it was appropriate to look at the Travo. Uh, ironically, in circumstances where there are no Travo for the CMR convention, and the council in that <coughs> case uh, had to persuade the court as well that other background papers came within the definition of preparatory papers. Uh, but the relevant paragraphs. Um, in, in this judgment, um, Lord Hamlin gave the judgment with which um, all, all the other uh, uh, justices agreed. At, at page 25, um, it is now generally recognised that the broad principles of general acceptation by reference to which international conventions should be interpreted include these rules of interpretation. So that's the Vienna Convention. See, for example, uh, the CMH Carter. This means that it is appropriate not only to apply the principles set out in Article 31 and 32, but also to follow the structured approach um, which they set out. And then over the page, paragraph 28. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm lost. Which, which page? I was at paragraph 25 on page 9 of the judgment. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and so paragraph... 25 sets out that it's generally recognised that essentially the rules of the Vienna Convention apply. Yeah. This means that it's appropriate not only to apply the principles set out in Articles 31 and 32, but also to follow the structured approach which they establish. Then Article 32, page, paragraph 28 over the page, Article 32 then allows for recourse to be had to supplementary material, including the preparatory work of the treaty and the circumstances of its conclusion, in order to confirm the meaning which results from the application of Article 31, or in order to determine uh, the meaning. <coughs> Such material may only be used to determine the meaning where the interpretation according to Article 31 leaves the meaning ambiguous um, or obscure. Um, in, in one sense, I, I find that a little um, difficult, but it's what the Supreme Court have said and what, our, our, what the Venner Convention says, because if you need to confirm the meaning, that suggests to me that there may be some uh, uncertainty, but whether it's uncertainty it's a, as much as the meaning being ambiguous or obscure, there may be just shades of grey here. Uh, uh, <coughs> so you, you can look at the, the Travo to confirm the meaning or to determine the meaning. And then perhaps more relevantly at paragraph 32, uh, Lord Hamlin said, the appellants do not suggest that the Travo disclose a bullseye, which is the phrase that has been in common use um, uh, in other cases. But Mr John Kimball, Casey, the appellants submitted that this was only required when they are used to determine rather than confirm the result, uh, the meaning resulting from the application of Article 31. I accept that submission. So if you're looking at the Travo simply for confirming, you don't need a bullseye. But if you need to determine the meaning, um, you do need a bullseye. And that possibly has the logical difficulty that if you can't determine the meaning under Article 31 and there isn't a bullseye in the Travo, what can you look at to, to determine the meeting, the, the meaning? Uh, and that may be an issue that a different court has to grapple with on, on a different day. But we say that in terms of confirming what we say is the correct construction of, of, of the definition of ship owner and confirming the circumstances in which a charterer can limit, it's legitimate to look at the Travo, even if they don't <coughs> score a bull's because they are con confirmation um, that, that our su submission is correct. Why was this heard by a panel of seven? Was there sort of 
um, because there was settled law up to House of Lords level and the court was being asked to depart. Thank you. And, and declined to do so. Um, uh, uh, so the, the previous versions of the convention are, which we've been looking at, are Article 32 material. Well, we would submit they are also Article 31 material in the sense that they're context and they shed light on purpose. But they are certainly <coughs> Article 32. Well, I was looking at um, the CMA Jakarta, which mm. I see is actually approved at paragraph 23 and then Lord Justice Longmore in the CMA Jakarta says the existence and terms of the previous convention is one of the circumstances which is an article 32 word yeah that that suggests that that's also consistent with my reading of article 31 which specifies what the context is My Lord, my Lady, yes, and that's why I answered my Lady's question earlier by starting by saying that we, we on our submission, this would be an exercise of confirmation, uh, which, which takes one to Article um, 32 to confirm what, what we say, mm. uh, picking up what my Lord's wording, a, a common sense understanding of defining charter within the ambit of the phrase shipping. Yes, but the reason I, I mean, you could equally say that the starting point is you've got a perfectly straightforward definition that tells you that ship owner includes these other categories of persons without any elaboration on that. <coughs> and then you've got wording in Article 2, which the local learned friend is saying is perfectly clear. Hence my question, where's the un where is the... Um, uncertainty. I think you get, you, you get some. You're, you're, I think you're relying on Articles 9 and 11 plus the use of the term ship owner as the defined term. It, it, it is the combination of, of Articles 9 and 11 plus the way ship owner is defined that leads one to the meaning of, that, that we contend for. And one then confirms that by looking back to 1957 and 1924 and the travaux for, for those two conventions. And as circumstances, and also the travaux for the 1976 convention as preparatory material. <coughs> and there you do rely on the absence rather than the presence of anything. <coughs> exactly. And if I'm in confirmation area, I don't I don't need a bullseye. It's simply yeah. for the purposes of confirming the, the meaning that we invite the court to attribute. But equally, I take it you would accept that in principle it's wrong and not acceptable to, as it were, look at material like the travel in order to create an ambiguity which does not arise on a proper reading of the text as it stands. I mean, in other words, if, if it is, if the clear and natural meaning is not such as to give rise to any ambiguity, then you can't create an ambiguity by looking at the legislative history? N not looked at from that end of the telescope, I accept. Mm. But, of course, one of the difficulties that comes in is saying my learned friend were on his feet and saying, well, I'm right. Let's look at the travo to confirm that I'm right. The travo then suggests that you're wrong. <laughs> the travo ha actually have created well, the ambiguity. So... So, in one sense, that may be a different route to the same result. So, if you look at the Travo to confirm your Article 31 meaning, and they don't, they have, by definition, created something more than just a need for confirmation. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I think that might be going further than you're supposed to go, because, after all, the, as with domestic legislation, I mean, the text in force is basically where any interested person should be able to find the answer to their question. And it's only if a reading of that on fair and natural use of language gives rise to an ambiguity one is it, that one can go any further. I mean, otherwise, it's an endless invitation for us all to trawl through thousands of pages of travel when that's precisely what you shouldn't have to do. 
Um, in order to answer a straightforward question, such as in the question in the present case. My Lord, if there were an, an obvious and straightforward meaning, then, then I, I see the force of what my Lord said. Yes. I mean, one other point, of course, is that Article 31 obviously refers to object and purpose as well as content. And slightly oddly, it goes on to be very prescriptive about what the context is. It, it, does it doesn't that. Mm. inform as to how you are supposed to ascertain the purpose. Now, as the Lord says, normally you just look at the word. Do you say that you can go wider to understand the purpose? Because you've, you've explained your point that the, the 1976 convention was intended to make two, three specific changes and not change anything else. Do we is that something we can have regard to before we start looking at the words, as it were? My lady, it, it, it comes back, I think, to the answer I gave earlier um, about the need to confirm uh, an interpretation which we say is sufficiently apparent from looking at articles 1, 2, 9, and 11 together. Mm. And Article 32 allows you to confirm that meaning, meaning and put it beyond doubt by looking at the other material. Um, a, 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 but one still has to consider the object and the purpose. A, and we submit as follows. In considering whether the Charter has a right to limit in respect of claims by the ship owner, which is the point raised in our response brief, it's legitimate for the court to ask itself why charters are given the right to limit. If the court asks itself that question by reference purely to the wording of the 76 Convention, the fact that the method, the drafting technique by which they are given the right to limit is to include them within the group that also includes the owners, suggests that they do not have that right. And the fact that a single limit of liability is created for the aggregate of all of those claims suggests that they do not have the right to limit against the show. And the fact that a fund constituted by one member is deemed to be constituted by all the members, suggests that they do not have that right. If one were only looking at, at the convention, that would, in our submission, be, or those would be, the factors that assisted the court to determine the purpose. But if it was necessary to confirm the purpose, rather than to confirm the meaning you get to under Article 31. But if you need to confirm the purpose, then it is legitimate to look at the previous conventions and the way they have presented the right to limit in order to ascertain the purpose of Article 31. I'm sorry, you made, you made three points there, and I didn't get them all. One was the drafting technique is that they are included within the um, term owner. Two uh, was then there's a, a single fund for the whole of the group. What was the third one? Third single fund against which all claimants with any claim that can be advanced against any member of the group have to prove. Well, you, I think you said the fund was deemed to be constituted, to be constituted. by all. That, that's the wording of Article yeah. 11. Thank you. Mm. Uh, and the, the court will have in mind, indeed, my Lord of Justice Mail has already um, adverted to the worked example that we gave in our, our skeleton argument and that I gave to the judge that we say make, makes good this point. So the, the vessel arrived at Willems Harbour with damaged cargo on board. Um, and um, cargo also encumbered with a lien in favour of the salvors. <coughs> it was entirely possible that cargo interests would arrest the vessel and bring a claim against my client to secure their cargo claim. 
my clients would have been permitted under the convention to limit their liability, constitute a fund in Germany and insist on the vessel being released because having constituted a fund, the vessel has to be released. Germany it is a convention, 76 and 96 protocol convention countries. Um, if we had constituted that fund under Article 11.3, it be deemed to be constituted on behalf of all of the members of the genus, all of the insiders. And on MSC's case, if they are entitled to limit claims we advance are limitable, we would be obliged to pursue our claim against the fund that, that we had created. Uh, 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 and that, in one sense, is the point we rely on is suggesting that the contrary construction of the convention leads to an absurd result. Uh, and um, we would end up on that posit, paying ourselves, so the fund that we had created, the money we'd put into a court fund account in Germany, would pay our claims. And it would diminish the fund available for everybody else. <coughs> so we'd be out of pocket for more than our losses, and MSC and their insurers wouldn't pay a cent. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as my Lord Lord Justice Mails has mentioned, the, the judge's response to that um, it was at paragraph 85 uh, of the judgment, where, uh, and if you turn that up at C, four five, page 68. Secondly, that claim would, he says, self-evidently not be limitable. Um, and he made the same point in paragraphs 86 and 87. And, and, and we um, submit that, that that is no answer to our point. Firstly, because it only deals with part of the absurdity which is that we end up paying ourselves. It, it doesn't meet the other absurd result, which is that our claim against the fund diminishes that part of the fund that would otherwise be available for the outsider claim. But in any event, we uh, respectfully submit that the judge was wrong on two counts. Firstly, it can't be assumed we have a claim against MSC for the value of the fund. For example, if we put up a club letter by way of the security rather than pay out the money, we, we don't suffer any loss until the fund is distributed to the other claimant. But, but secondly, and, uh, and more fundamentally, the posit we are testing is whether a charter can limit in respect of a claim by the owner. Uh, and therefore, we have to test the result by reference to the posit. So assume that a charter can, this, this is the posit we're testing, limit in response to a claim by the owner. Our claim to recover the cost of putting up the fund, a fund we have put up because of the cargo claims we are facing, would be on the posit paradigm example of a claim that could be limited. So whereas the judge has said self-evidently if we claimed the value of the fund <coughs> MSC couldn't limit it. With the greatest respect that's not evident let alone self-evident to us. We, we think the opposite is true. So our claim to put up the fund would itself then have to go into the limitation Uh, and th this 
approach to the convention it is broadly speaking the, the same as that which Mr Justice Thomas took in the Agency and could, could I for that purpose just ask the court to look at some other passages in the Agency um, authorities bundles tab 13 page and I suppose um, the other point you might make before we go to Mr Justice Thomas is that um, this is all a bit convoluted that's to say if the way <coughs> you get round the point that the charterers are entitled to limit is that you have a claim against them for the value of the fund which is not limitable that all sounds a bit complicated to me or and, there, and, there, and therefore probably not what um, you drafters of the convention had in mind in, in, indeed my lord and at first instance my learned friend put it slightly differently he suggested that there might have to be two funds um, one established by the owner and actual owner and one established by the charter and that was a submission that he doesn't renew now and that Mr Justice Andrew Baker didn't have very much time for at that stage um, but again th these are the points that Mr Justice Thomas had in mind <coughs> in the AGMC if we could turn to page 232 please uh, uh, and in the judgment at 232 of the authorities bundle right hand column beginning D, the fund, sorry, <coughs> beginning Article 9, so C, limits and aggregation, is the left-hand column. The relevant wording is in the right-hand column. Um, it, after the quote from the convention, it is the provision in Article 91A which, in my view, is significant, as it provides for the aggregation of all claims. And if I could just ask the court to read that paragraph, and then the next paragraph, beginning Article 11. And then going over the page, my lords and my lady, at page 233, about two thirds of the way down a paragraph beginning in my view. And if I could ask the court just to read that paragraph. then the, the conclusion uh, of Mr Justice Thomas on all these points is at 234 in the left hand column uh, which has the, the black lining from the law reports beginning it cannot and if I could ask the court to read that So the conclusion essentially is that looking at all these provisions together, uh, which was my latest point about Article 9 and Article 11 as well, it cannot have been the intention that you had this fund created on behalf of all of those within the group that might be diminished if the claim that the ship owner made against the charter had to be bought against the same fund. And, and the reasoning we've just looked at, although the Court of Appeal in the CMH Card case adopted a, a, a different approach by focusing on the, the definition of the claims in, in Article 2.1, that essential reasoning of Mr Justice Thomas was expressly approved by Lord Justice Longmore in the CMH Card case. Page 274 of the Authorities Bundle. Um, 
and in the left hand column right in the middle of the page the text beginning while I entirely agree with this passage from the Aegean Sea um, the considerations advanced by the judge to my mind more effectively support the conclusion that claims in respect of which an owner or a charter limit do not include claims for the loss of or damage to the ship relied on to calculate the limit so Lord Justice Longmore is getting to a, a different result but by the same analysis uh, and we suggest and, and we submit it's not inconsistent with what Lord Justice Longmore said that, that the correct result is in fact um, that the charter cannot limit in respect of any claims um, bought by the owner. Uh, uh, and the same um, uh, reasoning was, was approved by Lord Clark, albeit Obiter, in, in the Ocean Victory. And that's at page 319, tab 17. under the heading Articles 9 to 11. Um, Lord Justice Longwell treated these provisions as of some importance in reaching his conclusion. I, in my uh, opinion, he was correct to do so. In paragraph 25, he noted what Mr Justice Thomas set them out in detail in the Aegean Sea and broadly summarised them this way. Um, and then reading on, uh, there's the quote there, um, and then uh, further references at paragraph 83 and 84, and the concluding comment at the end of paragraph 84 at the foot of page 310. I agree with both uh, Mr Justice Thomas and Mr Justice David Steele in this respect. And the conclusion Lord Clark reaches, the same as Lord Justice Longmore, is that when one looks at Article 21A, the proper construction is that... Um, Claims in respect of damage to the ship are not within 2 a and I'll come on to 2 a this afternoon. But we, we submit that for today's purposes, the, the wider question, which was not before the court in, in Jakarta or Aegean Sea, the wider question we pose of whether Charter can limit at all in respect of ship owners' claims, um, the answer to that question follows from the same considerations that um, Mr Justice Thomas, Lord Justice Longmore and Lord Clark uh, applied in the passages I've just taken the court to. Uh, and so... Um, but they put it, I mean, Lord Clark puts it very much in terms of Article 21A and the meaning of property it might be said to be a bit surprising if there was a more fundamental objection to the point which she doesn't address. Um. <coughs> my, my Lord, yes. But I in Jakarta, of course, Mr Justice David Steele had put the gloss on the definition of charter saying it had to be a charter acting qua ship owner. Uh, and Lord Justice Longmore, rightly in our submission, concluded that was not an appropriate gloss to place on the word charter. <coughs> our approach is, is different in that we're not saying that you put a gloss on the word charter, but that you need to construe the claims in respect of which the charter can limit. And at a more headline point than was relevant in Jakarta, or the Aegean Sea, or indeed the Ocean Victory. That does not include claims by the ship owner. And I accept that that goes wider than anything that was concluded in those decisions. But that does not mean we're wrong if this point wasn't taken. So in Jakarta, essentially, the qua ship owner point was taken, but the point I advanced was not taken. And, and the, the only other point 
I've made the respect to the insider outsider point before, if I may, I move on to other points. It is this. Um, as my Lord has said, uh, the judge in dealing with this point uh, relied on or put weight on the fact that if the insider outsider point is correct, then we as owners could not limit if Charters brought a claim against us in respect of damage to the carcass when it was their carcass. And that's the point I dealt with with my Lord, Lord Justice Mayles at the beginning of these submissions. As advanced in this court, the point is that point only cuts one way. Uh, this may be me being confused. What about the scenario where the owner has some cargo? That was the second point. I was going okay, to. you're going to cover that. Thank you. Um, and, and Secondly, uh, the judge said, well, the result of your case would be that if you bought a claim against the charterers for damage to our property that was not part of the ship, and the example that the judge gave was containers, then that, that would not be limitable either. And the only point there in response to that is, well, we agree that that's what the convention says. But that doesn't undermine the validity of your point, in, in one sense. So you say there would not be limitation. I just want to be clear about your position. If the cargo, if the ship owner has property on board, like a container, you say any claim in respect of it would not be limitable. By the, if we were bringing a claim against the charge, yes. And that, that was the point. The judge said, well, that would be slightly odd. Uh, uh, and essentially, we say, well, that is what the convention says on our construction. And it, it's certainly no odder than the consequences of our worked example um, if the convention means something else. Uh, uh, and so it is our, our submission, as we set out in the respondent's notice, that charters are not entitled to limit in respect of claims brought by the ship. Uh, um, can I then compendiously package that up to save repeating it at, at, in relation to each of the other heads that I'm going to deal with? If and insofar as the court is against me on that, at what I call, I think, yesterday, the headline level, so if there's no absolute bar, nonetheless, when considering Article 21A, 21E, and 21F, and when construing those provisions for the purposes of characterising our claim, it is in respect of each of those subparagraphs legitimate to consider all the matters I relied on in respect to the headliner inside and outside. <coughs> in particular, the purpose for which charters are given the right to limit, the method by which they're given the right to limit, and the consequences in terms of a single fund of giving them the right to limit. I'll move on, if I may, to issue three. And in the numbering, that's Malone and Friends issue three, which I'm taking them out of order, but actually it becomes issue three. Um, Characterisation of the claims uh, for damage uh, to the vessel and consequential losses. Um, uh, uh, and the suggestion that the judge wrongly grouped all the claims or characterised them as a single claim. And the starting point when considering this issue is the, the law as stated by Lord um, Justice Longmore in, in Jakarta. Um, just if we can um, turn that up again. Authorities Bundle, tab 15, page 276. Uh, 
it is only in respect for. Of a wrong reference. <coughs> no, I haven't, sorry, 276, I was right all along. Um, towards the end of paragraph 35. It is only in respect of damage to cargo and not in respect of damage to the ship or consequential loss resulting therefrom that the charters in this case can limit their liability. So the, the court was considering the claims that were actually before the court in that case and saying only in respect of damage to the cargo. And that, by definition, in one sense, to hark back to the insider-outsider argument means a, an outside claim. Um, and, and cons but not in respect of damage to the ship and consequential loss. Uh, and again, just for clarity, um, if one goes back to where Lord Justice Longmore dealt with claim in respect of salvage, um, this is dealt with at the foot of page 274, right-hand column, uh, and the top of page 275, left-hand column. So part of the owner's claim was to recover the amount it had paid the salvors who had salved the ship. Uh, uh, and it is said there that the correct analysis of that claim, and I'm picking up uh, actually by the bold line, um, which the court will have, if however a claim for loss of or damage to the ship is not itself a claim with Article 21A, a claim for the amounts paid to salve the ship cannot be within 21A. Since it's not a claim in respect of loss of or damage to the property within that article, it may be that a claim to recover the costs incurred of salving a vessel is best understood as a claim for consequential loss resulting from the damage to the ship. So that's the illustration that Lord Justice Longmore gives um, and why we look at the phrase damage to the ship and consequential loss. Uh, and it, this issue was before the Supreme Court in Ocean Victory but didn't in the end arise. But the question which... Um, the way it was formulated um, is useful if I can ask the court to have page 288 of the authorities bundle, tab 17. The issue as defined for the Supreme Court. Um, if there was a breach of the safe port undertaking, um, is Daiichi entitled to limit its liability for Gar's losses um, or any, and if so, which of them? So the court was considering not just the whole of the losses, but any and if so, which of them, as against Sinochart, and Sinochart in turn against Guard pursuant to section 185. Uh, uh, and the answer that Lord Clark gave at paragraph um, 87, uh, page 211, for the reasons I've given, which are essentially the same as those the court has given, shall pass. I would hold that if there were a breach of the state court warranty, charters would not be entitled to limit their liability under the convention in accordance with the limitation fund calculated by reference to the vessel. And, and, and it's important in, in our submission to note that um, in uh, the Ocean Victory, the claim which we see from page 287 was made up of three heads. Paragraph 6 the judge awarded the agreed value of the vessel, so that's the pure value of the vessel. Damages in respect of liability for scopic expenses, damages for wreck removal expenses, and damage for the loss of hire. So this is a claim which included wreck removal expenses, uh, uh, and that included work in relation to the cargo. When the vessel foundered, it was still part laden with a cargo of iron ore. But that was held to be not limitable. Uh, and this goes to my learned friend's point that even if we're right on Article 21A, what is said about Article 21A depends on damage to the vessel and, and isn't engaged in relation to 21E and 21F. But in the House, I, I, in the Supreme Court, all of these heads were held to be not limitable for the same reason, the Jakarta reason, if I can put it that way. Uh, 
uh, and that included scoping I expenses. Um, scopic, uh, the salvage operation in this case was conducted under Lloyd's open form terms. And scopic is one of the clauses of the Lloyd's open form contract, or is appended to the Lloyd's open form contract and can be incorporated into the contract. I've forgotten if I ever knew what it, what it does. Uh, special compensation PI clauses, so perhaps I, I should explain. Um, Lloyd's Open Form of Salvage Contract is a traditional no cure, no pay form of contract under which the salvor gets an award if they successfully salve any property. It was perceived some years ago that a problem with that is that it was a disincentive for a salvor to carry out salvage operations where there was a risk of damage to the environment. Uh, uh, under the Salvage Convention, um, there was a, a, a procedure for special compensation to be paid if the salvor prevented damage to the environment, which was perceived by industry um, members, both salvors and insurers, to be not very effective. Scopic is a negotiated clause which can be included within a Lloyd's form contract, uh, which the salvor has the right to engage. So the Lloyd's form contract has a box on it that says Scopic included or not. But, but even if it's included, the salvor has to invoke it, otherwise it's not, not effective. Unless and until the salvor invokes the Scopic clause, they are only going to recover a salvage award or des uh, assessed on a traditional basis, i.e. not a percentage of, but by reference to the value of the property salve. Where Scopic is invoked, it's invariably invoked because the salvor realises that they're not going to recover enough property to get an award that will cover their expenses of the operation. And the scopic clause says once it's invoked, the salvor gets a daily rate for all of their equipment. And that daily rate is set out in an appendix to the scopic clause and is negotiated and reviewed between the ISU, the International Salvage Union, the salvors trade union and representatives of cargo insurers, sorry, hull insurers. And so scopic is, is essentially a safety net. That means that if the salvor is looking at a casualty and thinking, there's not going to be enough salve value here to give me an award, they can in invoke the scopic clause and they're guaranteed a daily rate. Yes. Um, and, and so, thank you very much. The, the scopic expenses um, that were claimed in, in this matter relate to payments that the owners have made to the salvor in relation to the salvage operation. But unlike an Article 13 award, by which I mean an award made pursuant to Article 13 of the Salvage Convention, Scopi is only payable by the owners. But it nonetheless reflects the salvage operation under which the salvors use their best endeavours to salve the ship and the cargo. So it's, it's classically invoked in a wreck situation. So in, in these circumstances, the salvor is doing what they can to recover the wreck, including one assumes cargo on board as far as it could be, mm. and is paid scopic consideration. And right. that expense, as well as the other wreck removal expenses, were held not permissible in the ocean victory on the same grounds as the pure repair clause. And that is why we say the Jakarta test, the consideration of whether you're looking at damage to the ship and consequential loss, applies equally to Article 2.1e and 2.1f, whereas my learned friend said it didn't. Taking that point slightly out of turn, but I hope it's useful. Um, the judge's approach was therefore to look at the question of whether the losses we claimed were in respect of damage to the ship and consequential <coughs> losses therefrom. Um, in their skeleton argument at paragraph 5, 
uh, 25.3, at page 274 of the Bible. Uh, my learned friends uh, rightly accept that a charter is not entitled to limit its liability under Article 251A for damage to the ship itself. We say, actually, that includes 20, sorry, 20, Article 2.1A. Uh, we say that applies to 2.1E and F as well for the reasons I've just given. They then say a charter is not entitled to limit its liability under 2.1A for damage which is consequential on damage to the ship. And that again is correct, but also applies to E and F. Um, throughout the rest of their skeleton argument, however, when they deal with this point, they only deal, they only refer to damage to the ship. So w when the court is looking at Malone and Friends' skeleton argument, um, preparing judgment, we would invite you to read back in, for example, at paragraph 49, I'm not going to take you to all of these, but just to give you the list, paragraph 49, 50, subparagraph 3, 55, 56, 57, 60, and 63, subparagraph 2. Those are all places where Malone and Friends say we, we accept that can't limit in respect of damage to the ship, but omit to add the words or, or consequential loss resulting therefrom, which are important for the construction exercise the court is dealing with. And it, it is correct that the judge held at paragraph 103, um, page 72 of the bundle, the call bundle. that the correct plain characterization in this case is that from the perspective of the amended convention, Ponty made good in the arbitration a claim singular in respect of damage to the ship, including consequential loss resulting from having a damaged ship. But with respect, that does not mean that the judge overlooked the fact that our claim was made up of what Malone and friends call a portfolio of losses. We had advanced, and the judge was well aware of this, numerous heads of claim that the judge had seen that spreadsheet that, that, that the court looked at. And in fact, he had to look at it in more detail because he had to determine whether some claims were within one characterization or another. Um, we have always accepted that some of the claims are limitable. The d death benefit claims are limitable, but MSC doesn't seek to limit in respect of them because the amount paid out is way below the fund. And any cargo indemnity um, MSC, on the other hand, accepts and always has, or certainly at all material times, has accepted that some of the claims are not limitable. For example, the hire that they were ordered to pay on the basis of the ship, in fact, remained on hire. And so the judge did not, in our submission, and I'm looking at paragraph 48, I don't think we need to turn it up, but paragraph 48 of Malone and Friends' skeleton, how they put it is, he did not try to characterize the whole claim within a single category. So he didn't say, I've got a single category, category and I've got to lump uh, everything into it. And so I if one looks at the appellant's notice, at tab two of the core bundle, page 15, the error that is alleged in ground three <coughs> simply did not occur. He did not hold that the appellant's liability was a single claim in respect of damage to the vessel. He held, which is why I took the court for what the judge actually said, that from the perspective of the convention, what we had made good was a single claim. In other words, all of the claims that were in dispute in front of the judge were properly characterised as claims for loss or damage resulting from the damage to the vessel and consequential loss thereon. And because they were all categorised in that way, they formed part of that singular claim. So he didn't start at the wrong end and say, I've got to squeeze everything into one category. He looked at all the claims and concluded that they were, in fact, all of that category. Uh, and so because he's looking at it 
from the perspective of the limitation and undertaking the characterization process. He's undertaken precisely the right question. Uh, task. So if one looks then at the approach that my learned friends contend for in paragraph 50 of their skeleton arguments, page 281. The first question um, they pose, does Article 2.1 of the Convention require that a claim in the sense of a demand for payment or by a single claimant should be characterised as having a single character? Or is the proper approach to consider a separate component as a separate component claims claims for different heads of loss? We say that question simply doesn't arise. Uh, and the reason um, it doesn't arise is because the answer is no, uh, for broadly the reasons that my learned friends then give out at paragraph 51 of their skeleton argument, although we dispute the reference to the judge's contrary approach. So, no, Article 2.1 does not require a claim to be brought um, to be characterised as having a single character. But that is not what the judge did. And, uh, and in that respect, my learned friend is right to point out that in the Aegean Sea, there were six heads of claim considered by the judge. I think he suggests that there were two heads of claim in, in the CMA Jakarta. If we could just turn up Jakarta again at tab 16 of the authorities bundle. In, in fact, th there were three heads of claim. Um, sorry, I've given the wrong reference. Jakarta is um, tab 15 of the bundle. Uh, th there were three heads of claim uh, in CMA uh, Jakarta. Uh, we see this from the footnote of 266. Owners claim damages of 26 odd million for cost of repairing the vessel, including sums paid to the salvage company, and we've looked at that. In, in the middle of the left-hand column, the owners also claim to be indemnified in their respective liability to contribute in general average, and their liability uh, to the cargo owners for loss or damage to the cargo. Uh, and as we know, Lord Justice Longmore said, well, the claim for damage to the ship is not limitable. And he said the claim for damage to the cargo is limitable. So he's taking exactly the same approach as we end up with in this case. But significantly, he also held that the claim I in relation to a liability contribute in general average was not limitable. We see that at page 275. Um, left-hand column, paragraph 30. And the same principle, so that's the principle that the judge had, uh, Lord Justice Longwell had applied to the claim in salvage, applied to the claim in general average. And, and that's important because owners were claiming indemnity in respect of their obligation to contribute in general average. And that's contribute in general average. So there have been general average expenses or sacrifices made as a result of the casualty, in respect of which owners have to pay a contribution. By definition, that must mean that it relates to the cargo, because the contributing parties, or, or the parties to the common maritime venture, giving rise to the general average adjustments and the obligation to contribute, are the ship, perhaps the freight, but certainly the cargo. So a, a, a contribution in general average suggests a contribution to cargo. But nonetheless, Lord Justice Longmore concludes that that cannot be limited because it's in effect a consequential loss to right and the damage to the ship. But also, uh, and, and perhaps more importantly for this respect, as well as the three headline claims, the claim for 26 odd million in respect of damage to the vessel was in fact made up of eight separate items. We
we see that from the first sentence of paragraph 29. The eighth item, or it may even have been more than eight, but at least eight items. The eighth item in the ship owner's claim for the cost of repair resulting from the breach of the charter party was the salvage. So there must have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other heads grouped together as the claim for damage to the vessel. So Lord Justice Longmore has in fact done exactly what we say the judge has done in this case, which is to assimilate all the limbs of the claim for damage to the vessel into one, including the south, and say they are all properly categorised as such. So far as the general average contribution is concerned, um, the only issue was whether it fell within Article 21A, and he held it didn't because it was damage to the vessel and not damage to other property on board. Um, but that doesn't address the question, does it, whether um, there could have been a right to limit if it had been possible to bring that claim within one of the other paragraphs, or, or, or to put it more generally, uh, if it was a claim which could be regarded as uh, in respect of damage to the vessel, but was also um, something else within P or F. Indeed, my lord. But the other seven heads, regrettably we don't know what the other seven heads, um, or at least seven making up the 26 million were. But, but what we do know, again going back to the head notes at page 266, is that there was an explosion and fire on board the vessel. Um, she was abandoned by the crew. Salvage services were rendered to the ship and the cargo. And following discharge of containers, both damaged and undamaged, the vessel underwent substantial repairs. Now, uh, we simply don't know either way whether owners paid the cost, for example, of discharging the containers and whether that formed part of their claim. We know that owners paid their share of the salvage, and that formed part of their claim. But what we do know is that at least eight heads were put forward as damaged to the vessel, and they were all treated for those purposes as a single claim, which is exactly the approach that Mr. Justice Andrew Baker took in our case. And as I've said, there were at least four heads of claim in our case. The unpaid hire, indemnities in respect of the tender for claim, the cargo claim. And if all the remaining heads come under the heading, um, claims in respect of damage to the ship, that simply means that's how they're properly characterised. Well, does what you've just said amount to uh, any more than saying that given the facts of the CMA Jakarta, um, it's quite possible that there were um, heads of loss which might have fallen within, for example, paragraph E, but we don't know for sure whether there were, and we don't know whether um, the point in which Mr Kenny has taken was run in that case. It seems it, it, seems it wasn't, because it's not addressed anywhere. It, indeed, but what we also know from the Ocean Victory is that expenses expressly described by Lord Clark as rep removals, and therefore one would have thought potentially within 2-1-E, if there was any cargo involved. I can't say 2-1-D, because 2-1-D doesn't form part of English law. We, we, we derogate it. Does it amount to saying that um, paragraph A effectively has precedence over the other paragraphs? Um, my lady, I can't put it as high as saying has precedence over. But that's why I said in my submissions yesterday I was going to do with paragraph A first, because it's described, um, I, I think I referred to where it's described in the Travo. I'm not simply referring to the Travo again, but as, as essentially the, the lead, the gateway, the main 
Um, yes, I forget the phrase uh, as well. Category of limitations. Sorry, I, I can't put it any higher than that. But but it comes it comes first. The, the others are all ad additions to the basic right to limit, which is in two one a. Um, and so, because MSC concedes that a charter can't in time can't limit under two one a in respect of damage to the ship or, or consequential loss, that gives rise. I was looking at my learned friend's questions he poses at paragraph fifty of this skeleton argument. Gives rise to the second question, which is at um, paragraph fifty three. He says, "What is the proper approach?" Categorization and are all heads of loss claimed by Kenya be categorized as or only as claims in respect of damage to the ship? Now, we would suggest that the correct approach is characterization. I was looking at the character of the claim, not categorization, one is not trying to shoehorn any particular claim into a particular category. But we wouldn't particularly disagree with what MSC says the right test at paragraph 52. We need to consider how each head of loss should be fairly or properly characterised. But with one gloss, that means characterised for limitation purposes. That is to say, bearing in mind the purpose for which charters are given the right to limit. Uh, and indeed, my learned friends say that their approach underlies, this is their footnote 24, the judge's approach. to apply that process of characterization, uh, we say that the judge got it right to characterize everything, uh, all the remaining claims, uh, as claims for loss of or damage to the ship or consequential loss results of that right. Well, looks at paragraph 56 of the Learned Friends Skeleton Argument and footnote 26. Um, MSC accepts that all of the relevant losses were caused by the damage to the ship. And that all of the relevant losses were connected with the repair of the ship, and that they all needed to be incurred if the ship was to be repaired. And that all of the relevant losses costs were in fact incurred in a, order to enable us to have the ship repaired. And that all the relevant heads of loss are fairly and naturally described or categorised as losses consequential on the damage to the ship. That's footnote 26. We say that some of the costs are in fact direct costs rather than consequential. But for these purposes, that doesn't matter because there's no right to limit in respect of either. Uh, and in those circumstances, we would respectfully suggest that the judge's conclusion that all of those heads are correctly characterised for the purposes of limitation as claims in respect of damage to the ship or consequential loss resulting therefrom. And there is therefore no right to limit in respect of any of them. And in some ways, my learned friend's point was, well, that may be right for 2.1a, but it doesn't then go on to be applicable for 2.1e and f. But the reason that's the right answer for 2.1a is found in the fact that it can't be supposed that it was ever the intention of those drafting the conventions, I use the word conventions advisedly in this context, but even if I was limited to the 76 conventions, the convention, that a charterer should have the right to limit liability by reference to the tonnage of the ship that he has caused damage to. And that is the rationale of Mr. Justice Thomas, Mr. Justice David Steele, Lord Justice Longmore, and Lord Clark. They all refer to the fact that it cannot have been intended that the charterer should be entitled to where 
saying is damage to the ship by reference to the tonnage of the ship. And even though 21E and 21F are not engaged by the damage, if, as a matter of characterization, all of the losses, including those that my learned friend seeks to characterise as coming within E or F, if all of those losses were caused by the damage to the ship, connected with the repair of the ship, incurred in order to have the ship repaired, fairly categorised as losses consequential on the damage to the ship, so those are my learned friend's four concerns then all of those losses engage the same reasoning, which is that it cannot have been the intention that the charter can limit those claims by reference to the tonnage of the ship that they have damaged. And so just to pick up again on a couple more points from Lundgren, makes paragraph 58 of his skeleton. He says that it cannot be right to say that simply because a cost needs to be incurred to repair the vessel, then a claim for that cost is ipso facto not limitable. And we say there are two reasons why that doesn't exist. Firstly, it's not what the judge has done. He's not said just because it needs to be incurred for this purpose, therefore it's not limitable. He's, he's carried out a wider examination of the facts, as is clear from the findings of fact that I emphasised yesterday and this morning. But secondly, why, we would suggest rhetorically, can't that be right? If a cost needs to be incurred in order to repair the vessel, and the owner intends to and does incur it because he does repair then why is that cost not properly viewed as loss and damage to the ship and consequential loss of anything? And similarly, my learned friend also says, well, this can't be right, because otherwise the owner's decision about what to do, a subjective, secret decision, is determinative of the question of whether the claim can be limited. And he says that, that somehow makes it capricious or difficult to undertake the exercise that we're suggesting. Uh, uh, and we suggest that that also doesn't assist him. Firstly, because if the owner took a different decision, then a different loss would be incurred maybe no loss would be incurred if the owner abandoned the ship and the German authorities had to deal with it. That loss would then have to be characterised in its own right. The fact that the characterisation process is affected by the owner's decision is simply a consequence of the fact that the owner has to make decisions about what to do with his damaged ship. It doesn't invalidate the exercise that the judge undertook. And following on from that, the owner's decision as to what steps to take in response to casualties is always going to crystallise the loss and therefore be relevant to the purposes of characterisation. The owner's decision-making process, whether to engage salvos, which salvos to engage, which port of refuge to go to, when to accept re-delivery, whether to repair the vessel, all of these decisions that are the owner's decision will affect what expenses are incurred by the owner, what, if any, expenses are incurred by third parties. And, and so the vessel might repair the vessel, uh, sorry, the owner might repair the vessel or scrap her or sell her as she is to someone enterprising who thinks they can repair her. Or 
or simply abandon her, as the court is aware we threaten to do. And all those would crystallise different losses, which would need to be um, characterised and different considerations would come into play. But, but even taking matters the next logical step, even if, say, we decided to scrap the vessel, we would still have been scrapping her because she was damaged. A and there would still have been a claim for, for example, removing the cost of firefighting water and the like, but in a different context. It may all have been carried out by the scrapyard and diminished the scrap value that we got with the vessel. We simply don't know. And that is why it is not a negative feature of the process we invite the court to undertake, that characterisation will depend on the owner's decision. It will always depend on the owner's decision. And Malena Friend gave an example where the owner incurs a liability to a public authority that's removed the cargo from the ship. Uh, and and Malena Friend says, well, if, if the owner brings a recourse claim for the money they've had to pay the harbour authority and says, I was going to repair the vessel, and cargo needed to be removed anyway. The claim is not limitable. Uh, and he says that that illustrates why our approach must be wrong, because that leaves it all to the owner to say, well, I was going to repair in any event, uh, uh, and that it will all then turn on the owner's subjective intention. But we disagree with the premise of the example. On Malona Friend's example, the cargo has been removed by a public authority. The expense has been incurred by a public authority. And it's fair to infer that the public authority's reason for incurring that expense must be that it's exercising some statutory power, as harbour authorities in this jurisdiction have, and that there's presumably some perceived public need to remove the ship or the cargo or both. And so the claim against the owner is limitable under the Convention. Not in this jurisdiction, that's why I carefully send under the Convention, but we're construing the Convention. It would be limitable under Article 2.1d. And the recourse or the indemnity claim by the owner would likewise be limitable. And the owner couldn't say, oh, but I, I was going to repair anyway, and therefore it's not limitable. Indeed, the owner will have no interest in saying that, because he can limit in respect of the harbour authority's claim to start with and then he passes on the limited claim. Well, assuming it happens in a jurisdiction where the Convention applies. It, in, indeed, my Lord, but because we're looking at the correct construction of the Convention, the posit for all of this is we're looking at somewhere where the whole Convention applies. Well, the, the um, question of limiting claims by owner against charter um, originating outside those parties is only relevant if the claim against the owner by the third party is not limitable, because otherwise it doesn't rise. <coughs> no? My lord, no, because the, the posit, certainly the common ground, is that where the outsider's claim, the, the paradigm outsider claim that is limitable, would be limitable against the owner and against the charterer, so the, the cargo claim. The reason why it becomes relevant is if the owner is sued in some jurisdiction that doesn't apply the convention and pays too much, and they then bring a subrogated or recourse claim, and their claim against the fund is then limited. Yes. But on this posit, perhaps the better answer I, I should have given my lord is this. Um, we have to compare like with like. If we're looking at my learned friend's worked example, um, which is the harbour authority has done the job and sent the bill to the owner, under the convention, how does the convention treat the harbour authority's expense? Well, as a limitable claim against the owner, and therefore limitable by the owner, uh, limitable when the owner claims over against the charter. And so that's how the convention would treat that expense. Um, but in any event, even if Malone and Friend were right, and that claim would not, not be limitable, th th there's nothing surprising about result, because where the public authority in exercise of its power in 
incurs the cost in claims against the owner. As I said, there, there must be a reason. That they're doing it for their public authority reason. And therefore, the reason for the expense being incurred, the originating expense, is fundamentally different to where the owner decides to remove the cargo. And so it's not the happenstance of the fact that the vessel is ultimately going to be repaired that matters. We're looking at what expense was incurred, who, by, and why. And if a harbour authority it, it incurs an expense, a wreck removal expense, passes it on to the owner, and they incur it because, assuming they're not acting ultra-virus, they incur it because they have the power to do so under an act that, for parliamentary reasons, gives them the power to remove the wreck. And that's why the expense has been incurred. And, and that would, as it were, trump the owner saying, well, I was going to repair in any event. The, map, the other way around, if the owner was going to repair in any event, he'd have just done the job himself and not left it to the harbour board. And so on my learned friend's worked example, whether or not the harbour authority's claim would be limitable would depend on whether 21D was in force in the jurisdiction in question. But the limitability of the claim would not turn on the owner just saying, well, I was going to repair. Um, and so we do submit that in the light of the concessions I've taken the court to, the only conclusion is the one that the judge reached. And, and the final arguments um, my learned friends take in, in response are at paragraph 61 and 62 of their skeleton, where they say in the present case, given that the costs of discharging contaminating, decontaminating cargo were principally or primarily or directly costs of removing cargo from, from the ship, and this is somewhat foreshadowing the submissions we'll come on to this afternoon on um, E, E and F, that, that they shouldn't have been categorised by the judge as costs that were related, arising out of the damage to the vessel and consequential loss. Uh, and, and in our submission, that argument is not open to my learned friends. There's, there's no finding of fact that these costs were principally, primarily, or directly incurred for any purpose other than the findings of fact that I took my lord and my lady to yesterday. And the simple fact that some of these costs, and I carefully say some of them, are can be described as costs of removing the cargo or even decontaminating the cargo, it is not relevant because the court is engaged in characterising the claim for the purposes of the convention. And that's a convention that distinguishes between limitable and non-limitable claims. So what matters is the substance of what is occurring. Uh, uh, and my learned friends also say that paragraph 62, that whilst the relevant costs were all incurred in order to enable them, the repair of the ship. That was not the only reason they were incurred. They were also incurred because Conti had obligations to deliver the cargo to their owners and obligations to dispose, under German law, to dispose of the water and the waste without causing pollution. Uh, firstly, as far as we're aware, there's no finding that we were obliged to deliver the cargo to its owners. Our primary obligation would have been to comply with MSC's orders as to the cargo. Uh, as bailees of the cargo from MSC, the owners may have been entitled, depending on German law, which is where the cargo war was, to demand delivery up. But our principal obligation would be to deliver the cargo back to MSC, who had bailed the cargo to us. Wouldn't you have obligations to the cargo owners under the Basin Building? They were all MSC built of labour. So MSC was the contractual carrier for the purposes of all the contracts. Um, uh, uh, and the fact that we were under an obligation to dispose of the firefighting water and the waste is, is again I irrelevant because those obligations were only engaged once we had decided when and where to discharge them. And so, to conclude on this point, my learned friend said that if we were right, 
what was involved was a radical departure from the procedure that had been adopted in other cases. Uh, uh, referred to, to Carter and the de Flora and others. Uh, but with respect, what we say is the approach that, that we advocate of looking at the claims, concluding that they are all properly categorised as being in respect of damage to a and consequential loss, and therefore not limitable, is exactly the approach that was taken by the Court of Appeal in Jakarta and the Supreme Court in Ocean Victory. And if we're right on this point, Malone and Friends accept that they said so in terms in their permission to appeal skeleton, and I think in their notice of appeal, they, they don't repeat it in their skeleton argument, but I assume the concession is still made. If we're right on this point, that, that's an end of the matter. We don't need to go on to consider anything else. In other words, if the judge was right in his approach to characterisation, it's over all the time. Um, nonetheless, I will go on to look at A, E, and, e and F. Um, I hope relatively briefly, because my, my learned friend has covered much of the ground in my more general submission. If I can start with A, I won't finish A before my Don't mix it up. Um, to be entitled to limit under 21A, we can just have 21A open. I'm sure the court's familiar with it by now, but I'll remind of. To be entitled to limit under 21A, my learned friend would have to establish that one or more of our heads of claim was claim in respect of loss of life or personal injury or loss of or damage to property, including damage to harbour works, basins, waterways, occurring on board or in direct connection with the operation of the ship or with salvage operations, which we're not concerned with, and um, consequential loss arising therefrom. Um, Claimant's case is that the following claims fall within 2.1a, the cost of discharging, cleaning, storing, transshipping and releasing the cargo, so the villain's harbour costs, the cost of removing the firefighting water, the costs uh, of the payments made to national authorities to secure permission for the passage to villain's harbour, and the cost of removing waste. Uh, it's of note, we submit, that claimants previously argued that all of the other groups of fell within 2.1a. So at first instance, they also said the costs of salvage fell within 2.1a. The cost of repair fell within 2.1a. And the miscellaneous costs fell within 2.1a. They were some of the other groups that I showed you in the schedule yesterday. <clears throat> um, two points arise out of that observation, which is why I made it. Firstly, in its permission to appeal skeleton argument, MSC's case was still that miscellaneous costs were limitable under 2.1a. That's paragraph 19.3. They also make that point in the Notice of Appeal. Um, no argument has been advanced in support of that position, either in the appeal skeleton or yesterday. And I'm therefore proceeding on the assumption that they rightly accept that the miscellaneous costs are not limitable. That's a safe assumption. Um, secondly, however, if the argument that MSC runs in relation to 2.1a were correct, it would logically be correct that all those other heads of claim in respect of which MSC now accepts it cannot fit under 2.1a. Malone Friend's case is that um, the original autopolymerization of the DVB was loss of or damage to goods. And that the destruction of some cargo was loss of or damage to goods. He does not suggest that any part of our claim is a claim in respect of loss of or damage to property on board or in direct connection with the vessel. He can't because Jakarta and the Ocean Victory are against him, are as well. So his case has to be that our losses are consequential on the damage that happened to the cargo and in particular to the DVB. 
And he says that any or any substantial link between the damaged cargo, and for these purposes I'm going to use the phrase damaged cargo as a shorthand for the cargo that was damaged on board in particular, the, the, the DBB. A any or any sufficient link between the damaged cargo and the expense incurred m meets the threshold for Article 2.1a for the loss to be a consequential loss resulting there. We accept, as we have to, obvious, that the explosion and fire, so the loss of the DVB that vented from the tank, <coughs> the explosion that essentially destroyed the DVB that had vented, and the fire that ensued, are what English law might call a but-for cause of all of the losses we claim. Because if there had been no venting of the dangerous cargo and no explosion, none of what happened would have happened. But that's not enough, we submit. But if my learned friend were right, and that the link between the explosion and the fire and the damage to the cargo that was damaged, any or any substantial link, if that was sufficient to bring him within the wording of the article, consequential loss resulting therefrom. That would be good for all of our claims, logically. But, but he accepts that it isn't. Uh, and that, in our respectful submission, ought to be an end of the matter. But it obviously isn't, so I need to drill down I into the detail a little bit more. Uh, uh, and ju just um, bef before the court rises, I mentioned two points before I go into the detail. It is, we suggest, worth bearing in mind, as I've already mentioned, that we've always admitted that the MSC can limit its liability in relation to those parts of our claim where we seek to recover sums paid to the dependents of the deceased crew. Those claims are within 2-1-A because they're claims in respect of loss of life or personal injury and consequential loss resulting therefrom. And those claims illustrate how 2-1-A is supposed to work. If we had our magnifying glass out, we would see that amongst the crew claims are death benefits that we pay. I'll, I'll give you the reference in case my learned friend wants to check that I, I hope I've got this right. Uh, line 2287 at page 209, death benefit claim. So that's the direct loss, claim in respect of loss of life or personal injury. But they also include consequential losses. For example, we paid the cost of repatriating a coffin and funeral expenses, 228. Eight and 2289. And that, that's the kind of claim and consequential loss resulting therefrom that in our submission Article 21A is intended to cover. Likewise, we admit and have always admitted that MSC can limit in relation to any indemnity claim we bring in relation to any cargo claim that we are obliged to pay. Now, that eventuality becomes less likely by the day, given the time lapse. But we bought it, our claim in the arbitration included a claim for indemnities. The arbitrators have reserved jurisdiction to rule on it should we ever be held liable for the cargo claim. But we've always admitted that that would be a claim that was limited. But the cargo claim may be for the loss of or damage to the cargo, the physical damage to the cargo. That would be limitable. But equally, if a cargo claimant included in their cargo claim consequential loss resulting therefrom. For example, the amount of salvage paid by the cargo owner. That would be the consequential. And that again illustrates how 2-1-A um, is supposed to work. And, and all of these claims involve a claim by an outsider, again to come back to my headline phrase, who suffers direct loss and consequential loss. 
Um, my learned friend referred yesterday, and we'll come back to this, to the pollution claims in the Aegean Sea. And they were also for direct damage. So people whose fishing vessels or nets had been damaged by the oil pollution. And consequential loss resulting therefrom, the loss of earnings that they suffered as a result. And again, that is a paradigm example we would suggest of a claim where two on A, both limbs of it, physical loss and consequential loss are suffered. It is not in our submission, and for reasons I'll expand on after that, um, the intention of two on A, that it should create a fifth category of claim. So claims in respect of loss of life or personal injury on board, claim one. Claims in respect of damage to property on board, claim two. Claims in respect of loss of life or personal injury in direct connection with the operation of the ship, category three. Claims in respect of loss or damage to property in direct connection with the ship, category four. The words and consequential loss resulting therefrom simply confirm that if the claimant is claiming consequential losses as well as direct losses, the consequential losses are equally limited. They do not add a fifth category of claim, which is somehow claims that are a consequence, factually, or causally, of the damage to the so they do not cover any of the claims that we bring or have recovered in the last claim. Gives the court a heads up of where are we going. Um, yes. How, how are you doing on timing, do you think? Um, I, I have to... Um, um, say that I am behind schedule, but not too far behind schedule. Right. And I suspect not irrecoverably behind schedule, with some careful pruning with Mr. Walsh's assistance over the last hour. Good. Um, well, I think since the way you're now putting the insider-outsider point is a bit different from the way you put it below, um, you will need to leave Mr. Kenny some time to deal with that. Sorry, I was only going to ask in that context what time the court will be sitting to this afternoon. Um, uh, well, we'll sit a bit beyond four fifteen if we do if we do need to.